<laughs> so, okay. Thanks for being here, Johnny. Oh, I appreciate you having me. A uh, big week coming up for you. Uh, 60th anniversary of the whiskey, and you're playing on the 14th Sunday. Correct. And that's, uh, they opened, I guess, 64, if that's 60 years. And then your albums were 66 and 67 for Love, De Capo, and then Forever Changes in 67. Correct. Yeah. And then the beginning of 68, because I think they, they had, it started, I believe, in November. Then they released it again a couple of months later because the first release didn't go the way they expected. So they released it again the second time in 68. Now, you guys go back to the whiskey a long time because you were house fans before you sort of made the error of introducing the doors to that. Correct. We uh, actually, Johnny Rivers, he kind of owned the place. And, um, we were asked to play there, but the whiskey had a reputation at the time because it was owned by uh, several police officers from Chicago. They come to uh, Hollywood and, and start a club, but it had a reputation for not paying you. Wow. So um, we knew Ronnie Hare and she was the booker there and she guaranteed that we would get paid. So we played and actually got paid. And so we told everybody else, like the Iron Butterfly, Buffalo Springfield, those guys, because we were all friends. We lived in Laurel Canyon, basically next door to each other. So um, once uh, that happened, the other group started accepting the bookings there and the whiskey just took off. Yeah. So, um, Going back in time, you were born 1947, uh next month january 21st i mean february 21st in memphis tennessee correct yes and you moved out to los angeles in late 50s right no no it was a correct rather the earlier 50s i think somewhere like 54 55 you know as a kid then so it's hard to remember exactly when but arthur lee's parents um or his mother they moved out probably a year or so before we did and then we came out and just serendipitously, we ended up living in the same neighborhood, just a couple doors from each other. Now, our parents, my mother and Arthur's grandmother, Arthur's grandmother, or excuse me, Arthur's mother was a little older when he was born. So she was friends with my grandmother and they used to follow Jimmy Lunt's orchestra and all of the big bands back then. So Arthur's father was uh, Chester Taylor, who was first cornet player in Jimmy Lunsford's orchestra. And um, as I said, my grandmother and, and his mother were good friends and they traveled and, and hung out together. They called themselves the first groupies. So um, anyway, uh, so Arthur and I, as I say, go back a long way. And so when uh, his family moved first and then we moved right after that, maybe a year or so later, and we wound up, as I said, in the same neighborhood. So it was, it was interesting because it wasn't planned that way. We just wound up living next to each other. But back in Memphis, you guys had been childhood friends and played in the neighborhood, right? Correct. Yes. Arthur was a little older than me, but he was sort of like my big brother. Yeah. Very and cool. so, yeah. And then you went to Dorsey High School together? Correct, yes. And you had several bands, the, the American Four, the Lags, L L A Gs. Yes. And we had oh, we called ourselves the Weirds, the House Rock, or Johnny and the House Rockers. Oh, we had a whole bunch of different names. And the grassroots, um, just before prior to love, we were the grassroots first before uh, Lou Adler kind of appropriated our name and we had to change it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the first group I started was in, in uh, junior high school with Billy Preston. We went to junior high school and high school together. So we started a group. And in high school, we played a lot of assemblies and talent shows and things like that. And um, Arthur saw us playing because Arthur was in the sports. You know, he was on the basketball team, on the varsity basketball team, and, and he did very well. And he saw all the attention we were getting from the young ladies. So he asked if he could join. At that point, he wasn't a musician. He um, had taken accordion lessons. Like, you know, these guys used to go from door to door selling uh, lessons. So I took guitar lessons and Arthur wound up doing taking accordion lessons. But uh, he didn't want to obviously play accordion on stage. So he played conco and bongo drums and you know, percussion. And uh, when Billy left, Arthur tried his hand at playing organ. And he got to be very good at it. So, Wow. 
filling in for Billy Preston, not too <laughs> Yeah, Billy, we we really had a good group then. We played weddings, and this was in high school. Played weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals, whatever. You know, whoever needed a group, we we were there. And and uh, so we got a reputation as being... Uh, Billy did a credible imitation of Ray Charles back then. So we would do his whole uh, catalog. We'd do everything that Ray did. And um, we called ourselves later on uh, Billy Preston and the Soul Brothers, and we travel a lot and up and down doing um, fraternity parties and and um, weddings again and bar mitzvahs, whatever. And uh, it was fun. We actually made a living. I was probably at one point earning more than my dad was in high school. Now you were in the West Adams area of Los Angeles, so that correct. Was, yes, was there when the the Tin Freeway cut through there, or with, before that. Yeah, we were there before that, but yeah, they just basically divided the neighborhood up, and and uh, I remember as a guy from Jack Benny show, Eddie Rochester used to live around the corner from us, and uh, Albert Collins lived in the neighborhood, and um, Charles Wright from the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band, he lived right close to us, so there were a lot, a lot of musicians that lived in that area, and that when they built the tent, it just kind of... Um, destroyed the, the the continuity of the neighborhood, so that that was too bad because it was really a kind of you know there were block parties and and get-togethers there, and it was kind of a community that was just split in half by a freeway. Yeah, strange. Um, yeah, when did you pick up guitar? You said that the people going by selling lessons. Did you have to have the guitar first, or? Well, actually, I started a little bit before that, but I got serious when the guys came around selling lessons. I was in uh, elementary school, and we did show and tell. And a friend of mine, Danny Oaken, had a Harmony Sovereign guitar. And um, he gets called to the nurse's office, and he asked me to hold his guitar and, you know, look after it. So I held it and strummed it and fell in love. And... uh I went home, of course, and asked my dad to buy a guitar for me. And, and, you know, being a child, he said no. But I was insistent, and I tried to make one from a cigar box and a, you know, a two-by-four. And uh, my father saw that I was serious, so he bought a little Stella. I think he played eight bucks for it, something. And um, so I played that Sears for a while. Guitars? Pardon me? Stellas were like Sears guitars? You no, know, they were a little bit, maybe Sears, no, Silvertone were Sears. Oh, Stella was, I think Stella still makes a really, really, really inexpensive. Now they make them in Indonesia or somewhere, but they were probably the first guitars that most of the blues players played too because they were very, very inexpensive. Yet they, you could play them. They had a sound, you know, they weren't toys. And um, so I played that for a little while. And then serendipitously again, there was a guy going door to door selling lessons. And um, I ended up getting a Guild three quarter size guitar. Now my dad was on the hook for $300 then, which was a fortune back then. Yeah. So uh, of course he insisted that I go and take the lessons, which I did. So I did that for a couple of years. And then Adolf Jacobs at the Coasters lived in our area too. And he saw me coming back with the the little guild and he said oh, this is a piece of shit you can't play on this so he um gave me a vega a jazz guitar mm. and uh he started giving me lessons and pointers and stuff and so i just took off from there and you know I, i'm not name dropping but little richard and and people like them because you see back then the black community there were areas where black people weren't really welcome you know, cause you would see on like if you wanted to rent a place, you looked in the one ads and it would say restricted, restricted. So there were areas that we couldn't live. So people like Billy Preston and Nat Cole and we all lived basically in the same vicinity. And so it was it was the black community. So um, so when I mentioned these people, Johnny Guitar Watson and people like that, they lived in that area because that's how it was back then. Yeah. yeah. It's like the Beverly Hills of of the the black community yes 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 it, but it was you know maybe half and half because there were working class people there you know and uh, policemen a lot of policemen lived in the area and bus drivers and teachers but also doctors and lawyers lived in the same area and entertainers you know that's when i was mentioning earlier when they split up the community with the 10 the wellington road and buckingham road areas which had been part of that 
were now split, you know. So um, it was strange the way they did that because uh, in order to get, you know, from one place to the other, you had to go way, way around, you know, and there's this little bridge over the freeway that you could. So the neighborhoods, as I said, was just totally, you know, destroyed, basically. Yeah, that that's a shame. Yeah, it is. That's, that's the sort of south of downtown L.A. area near the Coliseum. Was it, The Coliseum was built by then, right? Yeah, the Coliseum. But no, but no we were a little north west of the Coliseum. Yeah. We were closer to um, the Crenshaw La Brea area. That would be one of the, the cross streets. Um, let's see, Arlington and Crenshaw, right in between those areas and West Adams would, would kind of intersect right there. Okay. So now, see, there are two West Adams. One is over by USC and one is over, uh, it's it's a, it's weird that they're both West Adams, but they're t totally in, you know, maybe, yeah, different districts. Yeah. Um, your guitar influences early on, who who did you listen to at the beginning and who did you want to emulate? Well, I listened to T-Bone Walker. My dad loved him, so I listened to him a lot. And Kenny Burrell, we listened to. Later, I took lessons from Barney Kessel, but he was just, you know, I was just enamored with his playing. And I loved Charlie Christian, Wes Montgomery, uh, Grant Green. There were so many people. Uh, Billy Butler from Hon That was one of the first songs I learned was Honky Tonk, you know, the guitar solo in that. That was just a staple for the, the frat parties. You had to play that. So I learned that just note for note. And um, But Johnny Guitar Watson, as I mentioned earlier, and of course, Adolph Jacobs, who was my mentor. So I had a lot of influences growing up. And there's a, a West Coast jazz area. I mean, West Coast jazz itself existed during the time you were growing up. And yes. There were all these clubs that had them. Did you go out to see them at the club? Well, yeah, of course, I was much too young to go in, but sometimes my dad would take me and and I just, you know, hang out around in front. You could hear like the It Club was a few blocks away on Washington. And Miles Davis or Coltrane and people like that would perform there. And so um, I really was um, influenced greatly by jazz because that was the music that I heard at home. My dad loved R&B, gospel and jazz, and that's what we heard. So and that was was a major influence. Jumping ahead, I I saw that you went into doing session work after you left love, left love, and you went to New York City. You worked yeah. with Miles Davis, correct? Yes, yes, I worked with Miles when he he had kind of taken a hiatus from music, and he was basically painting. He called himself a painter. He was going to be the new Picasso. So um, when he was starting to get himself back and try to get his lip in shape, I would work with him. And, and uh, so we never, we did record, but the recording that we did was he, the street musicians and drum circles we would see in Washington Square Park. And so he had an idea that he wanted to play with one of those. So we got together some people from the drum circles and we went into the studio to try to record, but because they weren't trained musicians, they would not leave room for the soloist to play. So it just became a cacophony of noise and sound. And if we tried to teach them, you know, basically the rudiments of putting together a record, then they would no longer be the amateur drum circle. So it, it just didn't work. It just, uh, there's a recording somewhere of us doing that, but it, it was not something that was commercially released. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, and you had the, the ability to play with them, though. That was very cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, see, when we played at Beat Olinos, I'm moving up now, when, when Love had formed, we played, which was right behind Shelley's Manhole, which was the jazz mecca. Now, the parking lot of the, um, the back door in the parking lot was the front of Beat Olinos, where we played. And so these jazz icons would come and they would maybe get 100 people in the club. I think the place held maybe 150. They'd get maybe 100, 150. We, across the street or across the alley, were playing at Vito Lido's, and we would literally have thousands of people on that because the club would only hold maybe 100, 150, but they would block off the street, Cosmos Alley, and put Voice of the Theater speakers there. And so we had huge crowds of kids coming to hear us and um, these jazz guys were just fascinated with that, this, you know. And so I, that's how I met him, uh, Miles Davis and Paul Horn. 
then I got to meet Elvin Jones, who was my idol. I think he's the greatest drummer who ever lived. Yeah. And so that it was just fascinating. And it was also to meet your icons and having them speak to you as though you were one of them. It was just amazing, you know, and it was because uh, of all of the people we were drawing. And it was just, you know, they wanted to be a part of that. And Miles always wanted to get into uh, that, that type of music, into a rock or, you know, uh, psychedelic music, which he later did with Bitches Grew and, and things. But yeah, but I think he got the idea from seeing all of the people that we were drawing and here are these guys who, you know, are masters at their particular in their chosen field. They're just, you know, icons and, and they're not drawing, you know, a tenth of the people that we are. So, Which is a shame in a sense. But <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. But, um because I, I remember sort of that experience of going to like the lighthouse to see MJQ. Yeah. And it's like, wow, well, lots of room around here. It's not like going to the Long Beach Auditorium or, you uh -huh. know, where people are just standing all over the place. But uh, the whole, where was Violito situated in? Okay. Uh, let me see. You, you would have, we'll, we'll start with, Sunset and Vine is a reference. Okay. Okay. And a street over would be Cahuenga. And then there's Wilcox. And we were, uh, there's a place called Cosmos Alley. There's this little thing. I think Charlie Chaplin had this place and they had a studio on there. Anyway, this is where Beto Lito's was. And there was nothing else on the street. These, these little studios had kind of closed down. And so they could block off one end, which would have been um, Hollywood Boulevard. And Sunset Boulevard is is um, that would be the cross streets where uh, Cosmos Alley was in between those two streets, and so as I said, they could block it off because it was a private street. There, and Lido Lido's was the only open business on that street, and that's how they were able to do so. And as I said, all of the kids would come there to see the group play, but they could, you know, it was way too many to get into that small club, so that's why they did that. Now, was this before or after your stint at the Whiskey? Oh, this would have been right before and during. Sometimes when we were still playing at Vito Lito's, we'd get a booking at the Whiskey and um, go back to playing at Vito Lito's because that was basically our home and we could get far more people there than we could in the Whiskey. So, uh, And um, we had a very good relationship with the owners. That was uh, Beto Lito's was Bill, Dorothy, Thomas, and Linda, and that's you know the, the their initials. So that that's um, how they got the name. And we were, as I said, we were pretty close to them, so we played there basically whenever we wanted to. But the Doors played there, Iron Butterfly played there quite a bit. Uh, most of the groups, ex with the exception of the Birds, would play there. You know, the Birds had gotten too big to play places like that. You know. No, did you ever play like um, Pandora's Box or? Yes, we did. Okay. Yeah, we when we were the grassroots before we changed our name to Love, we played Pandora's Box quite a bit, and the Galaxy and uh, London Fog, I believe, was another club we played. And let's see, there was the Purple Onion and the Sea Witch, so we played all of those places. Wow, days gone by. Yeah. So oh, after departing from love after being i guess there after brian mclean left the band uh arthur just sort of canceled everybody and fired everybody and started again no 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 that's the, arthur didn't fire anyone first of all there were five members in our group and we all got paid the same we all that was one of the things that was kind of a bone of contention with Arthur, but he had no more say so than anyone else. So he didn't have the right to fire anybody because the grassroots was together before Arthur came along. We were the grassroots playing at the Brave New World and Arthur was playing with Noonie Rickett uh, up in Reno. And he came down and heard us playing and asked if he could join that group because we were bringing you know huge crowds of people in. And so um, Arthur joined a group that was already successful. So as I said, he didn't fire anybody. We just went our separate ways. Okay, but then you um, he reformed Love in the late nineties or early 2000s with baby lemonade yes yes that's those are the people i play with now so right. they've been playing this music longer than we had been alive when we created it so yeah 
Yeah, and they're they're superb. You got Rusty Squeezebox and Mike Randell and uh, Danny Green, and you now have James Nolte on bass. Yes, yes, and and Willie Ames. Yeah, okay. Willie Ames plays uh, keyboards, and uh, we have a trumpet player from time to time. But when we play the whiskey on uh, the Sunday, we will have our strings and and the brass section. So the Forever Changes, that's what we call in the Forever Changes Ensemble, will be playing with us, and we will be doing uh, the album in its entirety, and uh, several others from our first album and second album. But we will do so. We're going to have a pretty long set, but we will do the Forever Changes in its entirety, every song. Now, is this the first time you did it since the show at the Echo be before COVID? E, the first time that we've um, gotten together with the ensemble, yes. Because yeah, yes, I, I was at that show. Yeah, that was um, an interesting thing because we had plans to, and we were going back to England and we had some, we we're going to go to Japan and then COVID hit and then it just killed everything. So, How did you react to COVID when it, it hit? I mean, every everybody's books just emptied um how did was there a silver lining that came out after that but things you had to learn to do to get through the COVID period no I don't see there was a silver lining because that basically just cut us off at the knees there were so many things that were planned and in the works that were put on hiatus and and still like the Australian tours we still haven't gotten that back and we booked to do Austin and, and uh, several other places which we have not uh, re-upped on the gig so um i was part of the first uh, astrazeneca study so i i took um probably back i think it was december of 2020 i got the first vaccine mm -hmm. and um it was rough let me tell you because you know my, my immune system wasn't ready for it so i i was you know, in rough shape for for a while but then um it just you know, I was fortunately, I've never gotten the virus, though members of our group have, uh, because I've had now, I've had probably 11 shots. So, <coughs> excuse me, I've had all of the uh, AstraZeneca, all of the Moderna, and all of the Pfizer's. Wow. And the boosters. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm up to six myself, but yeah. uh, that that's just the, the, when they all got issued. And I think I was Moderna. I think I've, the last boosters have been Pfizer, but uh -huh. when I was talking about the silver lining is uh, a lot of people, because they didn't have any work, they discovered in their downtime how to do like Zooms or um, make incomes of, of doing other things that they normally uh, would not have learned to do. Was Well, there I... I got seriously involved in writing this book. I'm still writing it, and it'll probably be another year or so before it's done because it will be the definitive book about love and the, the time period in which we were popular. So um, I did work on that. I'm also working on an album, which I'm still working on, and we will be going back into the studio in February to finish this. So there were things, projects that had long been you know, put on hold I was able to get together because of just, you know, having nothing else to do and no other distractions, you know, because there was no gig. So fortunately we were, Georgie and I and my wife, we were uh, careful with our money. And so we were able to to live without any income because we, we have a separate income from, from other sources. So um, we were fortunate in that, but a lot of friends weren't so fortunate. And so, you know, they're still in the hole. That that sucks. Um, yeah. Are, you mentioned a new album. Is that going to be your material or new love material? or? Mixed? Well, when we did Forever Changes, it was meant to be, this is why there was all the turmoil happening during the recording. It's meant to be a double album. And Brian and I had worked on material and when we get to the studio, we find that um, the record company had decided that instead of having a double album, we would just do one and then we do another one right after that. Well, you know, all hell broke loose. You know, Brian just basically, there was a mutiny and he wouldn't play Arthur's songs the way, you know, he normally would with the little flourishes and things that he did. And uh, so we had, um, for at one point, they had invited the wrecking crew in to play. 
and they came in and, and it sounded nothing like us. So there's one song on the album with members playing with us, but that was um, the extent of their involvement. But it, as I said, that album, it, it's just amazing that it even got finished, you know, because of all of the stuff that was happening around that album. And then they invited Neil Young to come in and like Neil hung out with us. We got high with Neil. There's no way on earth we we're going to listen to him as producer. So, of course, he was at home. But, you know, it was just chaos surrounding the album. So anyway, as I mentioned before, it was meant to be a double album. And Brian worked on material, as did I. And Brian's material came out later in an album called If You Believe In. But mine, I just tentatively named Gethsemane because I, it was, to me, I felt it was, you know, I'm a kid, you know. And so that was one of the greatest betrayals in, in the history in that in the Garden of Gethsemane. So I just basically, um, as a working title, my work was called Gethsemane. So there are several songs that were written in that period that were supposed to go on that album that obviously didn't. So at some point in this year, hopefully, those songs will be released. So they were songs written for love, but they were not played by those guys. They will be played by the people that I'm working with now from Baby Lemonade, who have been doing this material more than 30 years. So so it it is the new love in a sense. You you called it Love Revisited at one point. Now it's just yes. a love band or just love. Just love now. Yeah, we were Love Revisited to kind of differentiate. We didn't want people to, to think that you know, Arthur, because a lot of people didn't know that Arthur had passed. Yeah. And so some of the promoters still don't know that. And they, you know, um, when they promoters <laughs> asking, so uh, we have to explain to them. But yeah, we, um, so there was so much confusion and, and people still, when, when we would book a place, they would just say love. It wouldn't put love revisited. So we just decided to just be loved because as I say, these people had played this music longer than anybody, longer than we had been alive at the time we did it. So, now you had been on tour with Love from like 2003 to 2005, and that was the last tour that Arthur was on. And he Correct. Was in yes. 2006 in the yes. European tour was yes. the last, he didn't make the European tour. Well, we did several European tours, but the last one he didn't make. Because he, it was, we didn't realize it. I didn't know, but he had I discussed this with my father, but I was kept in the dark about his his, um, his illness. So um, I find out later and that he knew that he had leukemia and it had become advanced. And at that point, um, you know, he, he couldn't survive. Yeah. Um, are there is there any footage from that period where the two of you were together with love at that point or oh yeah there are lots of on on youtube there are a lot of um you have to kind of search for them but there's probably maybe 15 20 different songs that we played some of the same sometimes the same song over and over but yeah they're they're floating around youtube yeah. the i went through the the three original first albums and you're still in your set list you're playing like three or four songs from each album because they're they're perennial they uh -huh. they still have legs uh um orange skies uh from the second album um i'm trying to think of oh, well little red book of course yeah um but uh for me seven seven is i think that was the second album too right yes yes that's all we always play that even with the forever changes tour yeah, that's our closing number. That's our encore. We come back and we rock the house with seven and seven is and, and then we leave with the explosion. But um, we do a couple of the songs uh, that we do. Orange Skies and my, red, my Little Red Book. We do that. And Stephanie Knows Who. Sometimes we will do that. And, comes in color. and more. Yeah. And she comes in colors and can't explain. So those songs are they, they were kind of. Um, easily recognizable as songs that we had done and we also did them from the beginning so we we continually have those as part of our set yeah they for seven seven is that song always fascinated me because of it it has you know this high pace groove to it until the thunderclap explosion at the end and then it goes to this cool blues jam at the end that just fades out on the record uh -huh. 
and I'd always wish that there was more that I could hear. But when I see you guys play it live, that gets gets it. Yes, too. yeah, it gets extended. Yeah, they because. You know, back then, singles, 45s had to be a certain length or they wouldn't get played on the radio. So that's basically why the solo was was kind of uh, abbreviated. But we do it live now and I do the long, long version of it. And that's supposed to be the aftermath of the cataclysmic explosion. You have the atomic explosion and the aftermath is the blues kind of. And um, it it is, has been our signature song. It's been covered. I think at last count it had been covered 60 times by right? from the damned had done it. Oh uh, gosh, Alice and Change. There's so many different groups that have done this record. So it's it's cool. It it definitely has legs. Yeah. Uh, one of the other songs that I well, two other songs, but one that I really love is Will the Beep People Be the Time or Be Clark, Between Clark and Hillsdale? Yeah, we do that one sometimes too. Yeah. Between Clark and Hillsdale is where the whiskey sits. That's correct. There's a between uh, on uh, the whiskeys on Clark and Hilldale is where the eating affair used to be. And the eating affair was a place that was very, very inexpensive food. And it would be where all the kids would hang out because they get to just, you know, many of them, you know, were street people and they would just stay there all day. And, and uh, so um, you would see the people going back and forth from the whiskey, from the car to there, and there would be a caravan of people walking back and forth. So that's how the name came about. Well, I just love how the the song lyrics end missing one word and then uh-huh. start the next phrase, except for, I think, at the bridge or something like that, where it actually completes. But uh-huh. just brilliant writing. Yeah. And then one of, one of the other songs is... Um, damn. Uh, it just went out of my brain. Uh, this is the time, and these, uh, these. Oh, that's uh, you set the scene. You set the scene, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, the message in that, because uh, it seems like a two-part song in a way too. It yeah. starts off one way, and then it it gets to the message at the end. Uh, just a brilliant piece of writing. And that was a fascinating the way that song came together. It's actually three separate songs that we were working on and never finished. And Kenny Forsey on his own put these songs together. And then we got to the studio and recorded them. And David Angel just did a magnificent job that's seamless as we go from one song to the next song. And it sounds as though it were it was written that way, but actually it wasn't. It's just again, serendipitous, you know, it comes into play a lot with us because something that accidentally happened turns out to be great and you know that wasn't planned and many of the things that happened that's why it just seemed like certain things were destined because you know that album had we done the album that we initially planned it would not be the same album that we have because you know my forte is blues jazz blues and my stuff is in that vein and Brian did kind of show tunes and stuff and his thing. So had we put those together in kind of an amalgam, it would not have been the same album. So again, it was fortuitous that all of the chaos did happen because we came out of it with an iconic album that is just, you know, it has never been out of print from the moment it was printed till now. It's still always been in print and it has gone platinum many, many times over. So um it's it's it, listed in like the Ro- Rolling Stones top 100 albums of all time. Correct, and Shindig and several other we get, and the European Rock Critics. These that's the, an organization of of um, writers from uh, the, the Europe, the UK, and the European Union. We beat out Sgt. Pepper, so that that's just incredible. That's and then we got a proclamation from the British Parliament that Forever Changes was the greatest album in the history of rock and roll. And so we have that, <clears throat> excuse me, even though that's hyperbole, of course, it was still an honor to have them, you know, give us a, an official proclamation from the British Parliament. That's just amazing. Well, we've got to wrap it up now because we're less yeah. than a minute, but I want to thank you, Johnny, and everybody get out to the whiskey to see Love at uh, the 60th anniversary of the Whiskey Go Go. Thank you so much for having me, and we look forward to seeing you at the Whiskey. That'd be great. Cheers. Take care. <laughs> Take care, brother. Thank you. <laughs>